My name is Bill Logan, and uh, I run a small company called Urban Arborists in uh, New York City. And I, uh, I'm on the faculty at the New York Botanical Garden, uh, where I teach uh, pruning and tree identification and tree risk assessment and other things. I didn't start out to be an arborist. I started out to be a professor of comparative literature. And I couldn't stay indoors. And one day, as I was doing a, a journalist article on tree pruning, I met a person at the New York Botanical Garden who would only agree to be interviewed by me if I would climb a tree with him. So I did. And I used to be a rock climber. So I had so much fun. And we were 80 feet up this tree, and I didn't want to come down. And somewhere in the middle, I asked him, can I do this for a living? And he said, of course you can. <laughs> so I kind of changed from being a professor of comparative literature to being an arborist. I was starting late. I was in my early 30s. Thanks to Wayne K. Hilly, I said, OK, I can do this instead. And so I've been doing it ever since. And it also allows me to write. I, w I, I like to write books that don't have to be written to a market. So, um, so it allows me to write things like dirt and oak and air, which you know people when I, when I first got someone to publish Dirt, everyone thought I was writing something that was either a dirty book or a book that was a, go a book of gossip. And the first person who understood what I was doing was the mother superior of a strict Benedictine convent in, New in uh, Connecticut who said, yeah, I was talking to her through a grate, and when she heard what I was working on, she said, oh, come with me. And we, she came out of where she was supposed to be protected, walked me into the place where men are never supposed to go, and showed me her farming. I mean, it was like, I said, oh, this is good. You understand? This is what we're trying to get into. Well, that's what I used to ask my, uh, my mentor, Hans Jenny, and Hans would say, either he would refuse to answer, or he would say, soil is a body in nature. And what I was talking about this morning was all from Hans's idea that there are five kind of factors that tell you the personality of any soil. One is the climate it's in. Uh, one is the organisms that are living in it. One is the slope or lack of slope that it's on. One is the kind of rock it comes from. And the other is how long it's been in the ground. Um, so a soil is a living body made out of all those things together. So it's both organic and mineral. And it's those worlds both transformed and transforming, right? So it's incredibly dynamic, as we heard this morning, incredibly dynamic place where everything is in constant change, the mineral as much as the organic. As Mercy Eliade said, it is the generative matrix of all terrestrial manifestations of existence, which means everything that's born and lives ultimately comes from the soil. So that's why we should care about it. And particularly as arborists, I mean, if we, our trees are not only helpers of the soil, but also depend upon it. And you know, a great deal of that respiration I did a, a, a small study where four-fifths of the respiration in a small area was coming from the microbes and from the trees that were growing in a particular soil. So of the living things there, um, the soils, what keeps the soil healthy, microbes and trees are two of the key things to it. So if we love trees, or like Lynn, we love microbes, we, want the, we need the soil for them to be healthy. You know, there are so many things that we have learned for, or that the soil has taught us. One of my favorite examples is the cure for tuberculosis came from a soil bacterium. And, and the interesting thing is it was discovered in the 1950s, but it was predicted in the 1860s by the poet Walt Whitman, who said, how can it be that things are still alive if they lie down on the soil and dead bodies have been buried in the soil? Surely those dead bodies had catching diseases. How come I don't catch a disease? And then 75 years later, the, these people are sitting in a basement laboratory with Selman Waxman, and Rene Dubose's wife is dying of, of tuberculosis, and, the, and someone thinks to ask, well, if, a body, if a, a body dies of tuberculosis and is buried in the soil, why is the soil not poisoned? And they said, but wait a minute. We're microbiologists. We could figure that out. And out of that came Streptomycetes and the first of the, of the really powerful antibiotics. So that was something that is derived from the way the soil works as a living being. It's endless. As I often tell my students, I say, the bad thing about this is if you choose to do this, is that you probably won't make a lot of money. 
But the good thing about it is you will never be bored because we don't anywhere near fully understand it. And listening to the talks in this morning, you know, for all of the brilliant, interesting stuff about fungi, or, or I'm finding out that it's called fungi, the fungi is that they are, um, we don't know so little about them. I mean, for all that they're finding out, we still are just at the very surface of beginning to learn how tree and soil interactions actually work and how we might improve trees by improving the soil, which is something that deeply, deeply interests me, but we're just at the beginning of learning that. So part of the fun of this, or the fun, the great thing about this profession is that you will never finish learning about it. I remember when I started, because I started later than most people start, I had the impression that I was too old, that I was too this, that I was too that, and to have people who would welcome me and say, no, you're not, you're, you're just right, don't worry, was very important. A bunch of them, yes. They have what they call their great trees, and they frequently call on us to go out and look at them and assess them and tell them whether or not they are, uh, they are uh, good to go or if something has to happen to them. And we get into endless controversies because we have sometimes certified as quite fine trees that you can climb from the inside and, and then come out onto them uh, higher up because they are completely hollow. Um, so we get into a lot of fights about whether or not, oh, why, why are you saying this tree is completely hollow? It can't stay here. And say, well, and then we try to explain why we believe that with a certain regime of inspection, with a certain amount of crown reduction, we can probably keep this tree for a long time. And in others where it's just not possible and we end up having to prescribe, uh, usually not removal, but some form of fairly dramatic retren retrenchment. There are two trees in a, a, a park called Madison Square Park in the middle of Manhattan. They were two of the oldest um, um, trees in parks in New York City. Uh, they were each about five feet in diameter, which for us is a very large size in New York City, probably planted in the 1850s or 1860s. So for us, that's a fairly old tree in a park. And um, they were both tremendously, tremendously hollow. One of them, I was looking up at it one day from the ground, trying to just do a visual assessment of it. And way up at about 50 feet in the tree, there was this little knot hole and it looked as though someone had used a blue magic marker and painted it bright blue. I went, what? what's going on here? Who did that? And then I realized I was looking at the sky through the tree. And I went, uh-oh. So I actually petitioned the Parks Department to remove these trees because they're in the middle of a public park where thousands of people pass each day. Under one of the trees, when there were children's concerts, the mothers parked their strollers and took the babies over to the concert. So I had visions of this tree failing in a thunderstorm with the mothers and the babies and the strollers, and oh, awful. But the Parks Department said, no, these are two of our oldest trees. You can't remove them. So one, then we began a program of retrenchment on them. And I was concerned that we would lose the trees. So I was half hoping we would so that I wouldn't have to have nightmares about them. But we didn't. And you know, by, by working on them gradually, we found that they've been able to re-sprout. And people kind of like them now. They have an interesting form, not the form they did have, but they're still occupying the ground in a way that nothing else in that part of Manhattan does. Um, and so it's been delightful to try and take care of them. Um, and my other favorite tree is a willow. And uh, again, I had to, it was, it was just in terrible shape. It was in the back, a common back garden in the 40s in a place called Turtle Bay Houses, where a lot of very fancy people live. Uh, and it turns out the uh, writer E.B. White once lived there. So we were talking about this uh, dying willow tree, and uh, again, we asked permission to remove it. <laughs> so, no, you can't remove that. It's a famous tree. E.B. White wrote about it. He did. He wrote a very famous piece that all of us who love New York love it, basically because we read um, this, uh, this piece of E.B. White's that said, called Here is New York. And he talked about how after, the, this is right after World War II, he said, he said, but a single flight of planes could destroy this entire city, which he had described in such beautiful and loving terms. He said, what do we have to stand against that? And what he had to stand against it was this willow tree. <laughs> so here I am in the year 2010 or so saying, I, I don't think we can keep it anymore. We, we've cabled it six ways to Sunday. It's breaking like pottery where the cables are. Um, 
and it's going to fall on somebody. If it's okay with you, that's fine, it can fall. But they finally said, no, remove it. So we did remove it, but then we took uh, a few sticks and put them in the, in the soil in our yard, and uh, now we have a 40-foot tall willow tree in our yard. So we tell people that the tree has not disappeared, it has simply moved to Brooklyn. One thing that we try to do is, uh, I mean, we, there's no way to manage it all because there's so many trees, but what we usually recommend to clients is that they simply take a large plastic trash can, stick three or four holes in the base of it, and before the leaves emerge in the spring, run a lot of water through those, and that will take a salt, will leach through the soil very quickly. So that's one way to help with that. Occasionally when it's a large planting, we may come in with a water truck and do the same thing, simply try to get it to leach through. Um, but it's much better if we can do things that expand the tree's ability to root so that it can root well beyond the tree pit. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do in New York now is to find ways to do that. One was uh, invented at Cornell University where they use large, uh, kind of blocky, almost large gravel, together with a small amount of sandy loam soil and hydrogel, mix those together, and those can then be compacted to the extent that we have, it was a fairly great 1.8, 1.9 grams per cc. Um, we, can, we can compact them as much as they need to be compacted uh, in order to let fire trucks pass over and all the other things that legally have to do, and there's still room for roots, and there's still room for the tree to grow somewhat normally. The trouble is only somewhat, because there are lots of small and not very mobile um, uh, uh, hollows in the soil. So other people have been trying to use a very coarse sandy loam. A, a guy who I worked with who designs these uh, soils, his, his nickname is the Sandman, because his soils are basically coarse sand with a tiny bit of organic matter in. And those, of course, also you can compact, not quite as much, but you can compact them and roots can still get through. One problem where we sometimes find with those is that usually the coarse sand is such a dramatic contrast in texture with the root ball soils that sometimes you find water problems. Like the water will want to be in the sand, but will not go into the root ball, or the water will totally saturate the root ball before it goes out into the soil. So there can be problems with that. But those are both ways to kind of potentially allow the roots to get out. And then there are all the new suspended pavement ideas like uh, strata cells and silva cells and these things that are able to al allow you to work with non-compacted soils entirely. So roots can go way out into the landscape. Uh, we did a recent planting at, uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art where we used uh, Jim Urban silva cells and uh, they've worked remarkably. Trees would barely grow there at all uh, in the past, and we have uh, uh, both pollards and large uh, linden hedges just coming up like gangbusters. We have trouble controlling them. We thought we would have trouble getting them to grow. Well, one is simply to give more, more soil area, and we've just discussed that. Another is sometimes where you have limited soil depth and sometimes you're growing in containers, you can create good drainage in them. We're finding that with some of these new uh, highly organic soil mixes that we can grow small trees in them very effectively. So that seems to be another way. Um, another thing I'm finding is that in, uh, I've been having a lot of experience lately with uh, soils basically made of garbage that were implanted on the edges by dumping garbage or by dumping construction waste on the edges of New York. And we find that forests are coming up in these all by themselves. So it makes you think a little bit more, not for general use, but in areas like that, whether it might not be a good idea to develop a plant palette that likes that and study the ones that are existing and be able to use them. And there's no reason, because it, Ailanthus is not an unornamental tree. It's just a little bit invasive. Black uh, locusts, there are even cultivars of now. So you can put some of these trees that will tolerate um, extreme conditions and use them as a way to gradually remediate those extreme conditions, probably not in a human lifetime, but over generations. So that's, that's another thing. So I think there's a lot. And the other thing that I'm, it's kind of a pet project of mine, is to begin again to use, um, use uh, proper, not topping techniques, but proper pollarding techniques on young trees to try and maintain trees, for example, under wires in cities, 
but also trees that are in areas where lots of people pass, where we frequently have, we have tremendous lawsuits in New York where trees don't frequently fail, but when one fails, it's very likely to hit somebody. And if it does, it ends up with, uh, with a lot of money being spent on, on, on lawyers. So one thing we might do is in some cases, work on proper pollarity, which also will make the, the trees, I think, less likely to lift the sidewalks, less likely to move the curbs, and less likely to have large, uh, large branches that might uh, cause serious harm if they failed. So there are a lot of things we can do, I think. That's an interesting question. In a way, sometimes in New York, it's not difficult. If I climb a tree in somebody's backyard, there are very likely to be half a dozen people leaning out the window warning me not to harm the tree. Um, so that's good. Um, one thing we've tried to do and that I would love to do more of is to actually get people involved in planting and caring for trees. Um, there's a wonderful uh, nonprofit called Trees New York in New York City that's been doing this for years. One of the things they do is they give what's called a citizen pruners course at the end of which you receive from a representative of the mayor a little card that gives you the right to prune any New York City street tree as long as you do it from the ground and don't kill anybody. Um, and a lot of people take that course and it really deeply involves them in the life of trees in the city. Um, so that kind of thing. We also have done, uh, we've done bare root planting with school children where we will take say a two inch caliper tree of a species that can tolerate it and bare root it in the nursery and stick it in hydrogel and bag it and take it down. We can, we can put two or 250 of them in the back of a 24 foot truck, take them down and plant them. And, and then when you're planting, even with you know, elementary school children, they can carry the tree to the planting site. Uh, and we've had school children who then you know, will, will, will put signs, give their trees names, put signs on them and insist on their watering, insist on their care. And so it's, those are very good ways, I think, to, to involve people. and. Uh, and also to just, you know, go around talking about them all the time, which is what I like to do. There, there was a, a woman, an artist, who did a wonderful project for, the, I think, the, centena the centenary of uh, uh, a big avenue called the Grand Concourse in the, in the Bronx. And she selected like 250 or 300 trees on it and attached a phone code to each one. And she had people, sometimes arborists like me, but sometimes people who lived in the neighborhood. One was gang members who somehow liked this tree particularly. And they would just tell their story about the tree. And then it would be recorded. And then anyone could call in and hear the tree's story from the point of view of these people. And there were 250 of them. It was really lovely. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd like to leave some really beautifully trained trees in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art where I have 50 pollards and 85, uh, two double LAs of, of lindens. I'd like those to be finished by the time I retire. We're in our fifth year of training them now. And they're looking good, but they've still got a lot of ways to go. So I'd like to leave that as trees. I'd like to, I already have a group of students who graduated and I'm very proud of what they do. And uh, I like that, I, it makes me feel like I wasn't just kind of talking into the wind. Um, and otherwise, I write books, so I will just continue to write books. And uh, I've got a new book uh, that'll come out in March that's about the sprouting properties of trees and how important those have been to human civilization for, since, since the Mesolithic. And I'm very excited about that. That's kind of what is, is my become physically less able to do the physical work. I'm more and more interested in the reflective work. There's a company called W.W. Norton. And I think Norton has a, has a branch here, um, and they've been my publisher since the beginning. I have a wonderful, wonderful editor. She's just great. And uh, I hope I'll continue to work with her, do this one, and if I can, do one more before my memory fades entirely. <laughs>